Good morning and welcome to the Woodside Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm Pastor Vincent Saunders and you've joined our virtual congregation. We're so glad that you're here with us today. We hope that you'll enjoy our virtual cooking school for February, which has posted two excellent demonstrations by Diane and great health information from Chris and a devotional by Leanne Dawson. I also uh, want to invite you to our home if you would like to come and, and join us for indoor worship. We've also formed a partnership with the Fijian congregation. So if you see some folks here on Sabbath afternoon, they are our partners in the Fijian SDA church. Would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Dear God in heaven, thank you so much for your word, which teaches us about your love. We ask, dear Lord, that as we open your word, that you would be both an infinite and a personal friend to us. Reveal yourself to us in the scriptures today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. I'd like to start out today by talking about the history of Seventh-day Adventism and its connection to the black community. You see, I've enjoyed this website, Black SDA History, and I've really enjoyed getting to know how our forefathers, our forerunners, and the founders of our church were connected to the African-American community. There's a great documentary I want to promote to you, Heaven's Favorites, Blacks in the Millerite Movement. And this is a video that you can watch at blacksdahistory.com.org. Benjamin Baker, and this was just last October, and uh, in, uh, during all the pandemic. So I highly recommend that to you. You see, during her life, Ellen White maintained friendships with African-Americans, kept correspondence with them, lodged at their homes, spoke at black churches and schools and raised thousands of dollars for their ministries. Her son and daughter, very famously, James Edson and Emma White, co-founded the Southern Missionary Society that went forth throughout the South region. Now, the Black membership in the United States currently numbers approximately 300,000. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And there's a link in the notes of my sermon outline for the video if you'd just like to click on that and uh, watch that. It's fascinating to think about the history of our denomination and the history of Christianity throughout the world. Because the devil and in the great controversy has done a great job of pointing to a massive gap between us and God. The Bible tells us that we have an infinite personal God. You know, this last year, we've had to change a lot of things. We've had to really assess what we do, what church looks like. And go back a bit. I've learned some personal lessons. I've learned that I've got to depend on God and not humanity. I've learned that I've got to treasure precious time with friends and family, especially those, those precious touches. My love language uh, as a married man is physical touch. And in this era when you can't hug and stuff, I found it difficult myself. So treasure those precious time with families. And I've also learned during this past year that I should prioritize God's promises over humanity's frail hope. And so we'll discuss today an infinite personal God. This picture known as the creation of Adam, this painting, beautiful artwork by Michelangelo, 1500s, oh, sorry. Yes, Michelangelo, I'm sorry. It's in the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican, and I've been in that room. They don't like you to take pictures, and I was looking for the picture, but I snuck in. Picture, I may have shown it before, but this picture illustrates for us how humanity sees such a gap between even just within the epics of our origins. There's a massive gap between creator and his creature. This famous painting is equaled even with Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. 
hands of God and Adam being reproduced, countless, countless imitations. You've seen this before. What does the Bible say about our origins? How did God connect with our original parent? We find that in the amazing book of Genesis written by Moses, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Key verse, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Then the Lord God, the Lord, Yahweh, root word of Hayah, and, and so much meaning there. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. So much in this verse that Moses gives us an inclination into our original connection to an infinite personal God. That infinite God had spoken. The properties and substance of light came into existence. He spoke and the earth was formed. The stars cast about by the breath of his mouth. He just says things and they happen. This infinite personal God is described as forming us from the dust of the ground. You see this language in the Hebrew is that of a workshop. The, the workshop of God and to his marvelous hand performing the mysterious act of creation. The word is used in describing the activity of God who fashions various things, among other, other things, the light, as I mentioned, the human eye, the heart, the amazing organ of the heart, and the seasons. He's got the whole world in his hands. This is how this word formed is used. It's the Hebrew word yatsar. And it's like a potter who has a wheel and he's forming and molding. Just think of God forming that, taking the whole sixth day to speak the animals into existence, but yet to form very carefully every muscle, every sinew. And then after to create a form of Adam, to breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. Language here for breathe, nefa, to blow, to breathe or sniff at. And you got to blow right into the nostrils, as we do in CPR and so on. And just think about that connection between a creator and his creature in this era where we are separated from one another due to the health pandemic. Now, this is how personal God was just at our very origins. And so he must be able to carry us through these personal challenges that we're going through. I have additional notes about that verse, Genesis 2, 7. So key to understanding that when we were created, God said it was very good. Very good. And so we respond to the pandemic. I put up there a graphic on the screen, how different personalities respond to COVID-19. This is from the personalities.com. And it may be oversimplistic and overgeneralized, but in each personality type, their response to the pandemic may be different. For instance, the sanguine, the optimistic, spontaneous, people-oriented person, who values relationships and is very extroverted, may not be worried about this. They may comply, they may do online gatherings and try to you know, post recipes, things like that, but they may complain about missing their friends. The choleric person who is usually strong, decisive, results oriented, they are confident. They will get through this. They may resist the rules even. They tackle go-to lists with vigor. They make mask and hand sanitizer for others. They're irritated that others are not as task-oriented or productive. They're apt to believe it's all a conspiracy. They're angry at the government for overreaching. 
These are those that value work and are extroverted, a choleric. Here is someone who is phlegmatic. The phlegmatic, easygoing, consistent, support-oriented. They're not too worried or focused on the specifics. They're accepting of rules, but not strict. Happy to stay home if the job allows. They're calm. Happy if they can sleep late, can enjoy time at home, alone. Good excuse to just binge on the shows. Intense to get to the do-it-yourself projects. The easygoing, consistent, support-oriented, phlegmatic person values relationships and is introverted. Like I said, maybe oversimplistic, but helpful nonetheless. Are you melancholy? Are you detailed and compassionate, schedule-oriented? Do you worry about getting sick, maybe losing the job? You follow all of the rules. Do you enjoy staying at home? Do you know the statistics? Do you watch the briefings? You have your deliveries come to your home. Are you depressed over the global economic impacts? We are seeing devastation across the world because of this illness. That's more information about that at thepersonalities.com. But God has remedies for all. No matter what type of personality you have. Now, Jesus Christ assured us when he was telling his disciples and going about commissioning them for the ministry, Matthew chapter 10, he commissioned them and said in verse 28, Matthew 10, beginning with verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That soul that relates back to the living being that we were created to be, that creator has the power to judge all of us. So we're not to fear the outward circumstances. Here's, here's more Comparison, look in verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. You are more valuable than many sparrows. There's a Russian proverb that says it's a small sparrow but it's a bird. In other words, all of the qualities of birds are wrapped in that tiny, tiny little package, all the potential of a bird. And in commenting on this, we have to understand that even though he is an infinite, all-powerful God, the test is how to help him feel personal when he seems so far away. If Jesus' promise is true that we're val more valuable than many sparrows, what do we do when God seems so far from us? In this current challenging era that we're in, or a future or past challenge, there's something from Deuteronomy chapter 31. In verse 8, all flesh is like the grass, they wither and die in the sun, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 8, the Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And it goes on to talk about how Moses wrote his law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to all the elders of Israel. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That word spirit, that ruach, that breath, similar to the language that our origins had. We need that breath, that spirit of God to feel that he is near when we are brokenhearted. The devil wants us to think that we 
are very far apart from God. And that it is a great journey and a great challenge to approach him. You see, within the Bible, within the word of God, and within these mysteries that we discuss, that I try to teach on and simplify, this word of God reveals the character of a divine author. And there are mysteries that we can never fully comprehend as finite beings. You know what that means? Finite, fen, Latin, the end. We have an end. For dust we were, and to dust we shall return. The entrance of sin into the world, I'm quoting here from Steps to Christ, page 106. The entrance of sin into the world, the incarnation of Christ, regeneration, the resurrection, and many other subjects presented in the Bible are mysteries too deep for the human mind to explain or even fully comprehend. But we have no reason to doubt God's word because we cannot understand the mysteries of his providence. And that's why we're so dependent upon the Holy Spirit of God to reveal them to us when we read it. You see, these scriptures and these truths are to reveal an infinite and personal God. The infinite God is seen, is mighty. The Lord of hosts, and the personal God is also Emmanuel. El Shaddai, El Adonai, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. More from Steps to Christ, page 107. The difficulties of scripture have been urged by skeptics as an argument against the Bible. But so far from this, they constitute a strong evidence of his divine inspiration. That word breathed into similar concept, the origins of man, the origins of God's scripture, the breath of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> if his greatness and majesty could be grasped by finite minds in our, in our minds, then the Bible would not bear the unmistakable credentials of divine authority. The very grandeur and mystery of the themes presented should inspire faith in it as the word of God. If we could understand it all and make sense of it all and figure it out in a laboratory, wouldn't we shove it? and not mine it for more truth. Excuse me. Now I want to turn to Psalm 18 and evaluate the testimony of David. You see, David had very great anointing by the Lord, yet he had turbulent times in his life. And this particular song, as the superscript tells us, for the choir director, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So after the turbulent political rivalry that Saul engaged with David in, he writes this Psalm, my God and my strength, 50 verses, amazing verses, talking about a personal God. David was moved to affirm his love for the Lord who had protected him and delivered him. Psalm 18, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock and whom I take refuge, my shield. And the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And I am saved from my enemies. David's heart is evident here. Extremely evident. You see, David expresses his emotions and needs. Right in that very first verse. Excuse me. In my mouth. 
You see, David's emotions of love and gratitude are infused throughout these first few verses here. I love you, Lord. And that love is a kind of a love yeah, so deep. And then he talks about how he cried out to God and how God answered. Look in verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of this temple. And my cry for help before him came into his ears. What happens when someone and their voice comes into your ears? There's air. It's, it's a vibration. It's also a miracle of God that we're able to hear. Imagine God forming those little amazing bones, the drum and the hammer inside of our ears. And then being personified by the psalmist as a, a creator who has those same qualities and wants to hear our unique voices into his ear. Awed at God's answers to his prayer, David pictured the Lord in all his power, stepping into the material universe to deal with David's enemies. You see, he cried out. He declared his dependence on God. Psalm 18 continues, you see, while David believed that his own commitment to the Lord had made it possible for God to bless him, David realized that all credit for his accomplishments belonged to the Lord. And more qualities of God. Because David's praise was evoked not simply by the deliverance he had just experienced, but most significantly by his vision of God. God made everything to David. God was his salvation, his fortress, his deliverer. And we can personally apply that to our lives. This impressive 50 verse psalm reminds us to spend as much time in thanksgiving and praise for answered prayer as we do in bringing our requests to the Lord. Gospel workers tells us that it is a wonderful thing that we can pray effectually. That unworthy, erring mortals possess the power of offering their requests to God. What higher power can men desire than this? To be linked with the infinite God. To be linked with the infinite God through prayer. Wow. Feeble, sinful man has the privilege of speaking to his maker. We may utter words that reach the throne of the monarch of the universe. We may speak with Jesus as we walk by the way, and he says, I am thy right hand. Man, oh man, never more this week did I feel his right hand. And when I was, uh, well, you know, I, I actually am feeling a little too vulnerable to tell that and share that story right now. I have to do that at a future date, but uh, ask me about it sometime. I'm still recovering from that. Gospel workers, page 258, that was the quote there. Call on me and I will answer you. Jeremiah 33, 3. I will show you great and mighty, mysterious things which you still do not know about. Call to me and I will answer you in the amplified version. Fenced in and hidden, those are those great and mighty things. Things that the Holy Spirit can share with us. Jeremiah 33, 3. You see, we are worth many sparrows. Jesus assures us that we're worth many sparrows. And uh, as we consider the tiny sparrow, he has, he who has a care for the sparrow and clothes the grass of the field will not pass by those who have been formed in his own image purchased with his own blood, and pay no heed to their cries. There is such a thing known as the Java rice sparrow, and the Japanese have this tried and tested method of ingeniously changing the color and appearance of birds and animals. You see, they can take white sparrows, and they're produced 
White sparrows are produced by selecting a pair of grayish birds and keeping them in a white cage in a white room where they are attended by a white person dressed in white. No, not, not a white person dressed in white. Attended by a person dressed in white, excuse me. The mental effect on a series of generations of birds results in completely white birds. Interesting note there, the Java sparrow has been a popular cage bird in Asia, you know, you know, but it's illegal to possess one in California. This conversion through environment and time is our journey of salvation, is it not? Philippians 1 verse 6, and I am convinced, I'm sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return developing that good work and perfecting it, bringing it to full completion in you. These themes of maturity are brought about in the parable of the sower, how we become mature in the epistles. We can contrast that with what happens in the immature religion. that are idols made by humans and foolish. Those that are still in need of teaching and immaturity is ignorance of God's will. You see, we need to have maturity to stand during droughts, droughts like this current era. That one of the side effects of sin is that it stunts growth. God intended humans to live a full life. Sin does not allow us to reach our true potential. It makes people act like fools in very immature ways. Sin has stunted our growth. Although we claim wisdom, sin has made us fools. When Jesus cares for us, listen to this, we become like trees planted by abundant waters that have the maturity to stand during droughts. When Jesus cares for us, we become like those trees. How blessed is the one who does not follow the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the assembly of scoffers. Psalm 1. 1. And so we have this Opportunity to change through environment and time. This is what comforts me in my trouble. For your promise revives me. Psalm 119, 50. The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I sought your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. I considered my ways and turn my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. The courts of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. More promises in the Bible are available. I have a wonderful section in the back of my Bible called Promises and Perspectives from the Bible. I've made a copy of it and I put it on our website for download in the Zondervan version of the New American Standard Bible. And uh, I'll, I'll make that available to you. You can also email me, pastor at woodsidesda.org for copy. It has been tremendous to me in, in, in times of trouble. Look, look at what we have here as a promise of his presence. Joshua 1.5. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Joshua 1.5, on the borders of the promised land, are we not in the same type of predicament as Joshua? On the borders of the promised land. Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. And again in verse 7, I'm going to put those up. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. More from the Psalms. Or Matthew, rather, the New Testament. Jesus has promised to us, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Praise the Lord. Jesus promises to be with us. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. John 6, 37. And then Paul's amazing assurance in Romans 8. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present in Paul's time, persecution, and massive growth within the church through that persecution, nor things to come, 
all of the history in between all that happened and now. Nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know for some of you, that is your favorite passage in all of the Bible, Romans 8. And so in considering all of these promises of his presence, and considering how Michelangelo portrayed the original relationship as separated, I propose to you a picture of God. An infinite personal God. A picture of a caring infinite hand reaching down from the heavens in a supernatural way to grasp and very gently hold it. Vulnerable, dependent, infant hand. Seeking and reaching up for an affirmation of innocence. If you look closely within that picture, you will see a scar in that, in that hand. Appropriate scar of a God who bears our marks on his body. Gospel workers, we may commune with God in our hearts. We may walk in companionship with Christ. When engaged in our daily labor, we may breathe out our heart's desire, inaudible to any human ear, but that word cannot die without a way into silence, excuse me, nor can it be lost. Nothing can drown the soul's desire. It rises above the din of the street, Above the noise of the machinery, it is God to whom we are speaking and our prayer is heard. Continuing Gospel Workers, page 258. Ask then, ask and ye shall receive. Ask for humility, wisdom, courage, increase of faith, maturity. To every sincere prayer, an answer will come. It may not come just as you desire or at the time you look for it, but it will come in the way and at the time that will best meet your need. The prayers you offer in loneliness, in weariness, in trial, God answers, not always according to your expectations, but always for your good. Gospel Workers, page 258. This is the biblical picture of God. An infinite, personal God. More from Ellen White here. The greatest victories gained for the cause of God are not the result of labored arguments, ample facilities, wide influence, or abundance of means. They are gained in the audience chamber with God when with earnest agonizing faith, we lay hold upon the mighty arm of power. The greatest victories gained for the cause of God are not in apologetics or an ample facility or wide influence or an audience of means, abundance of means, excuse me. The most richest place that you can have is to be in prayer and commune with your maker because you are worth more than many sparrows. I have a poem to share with you. It's titled, A Little Sparrow. I am only a little sparrow, a bird of low degree. My life is of little value, but the dear Lord cares for me. He gave me a coat of feathers. Tis very plain, I know, with never a speck of crimson, for it was not made for show. But it keeps me warm in winter. It shields me from the rain. Were it bordered with gold and purple, perhaps it would make me vain. I have no barn or storehouse. I never sow or reap. God gives me a sparrow's portion, but never a seed to keep. If my meat is sometimes scanty, close picking makes it sweet. I have always enough to keep me, and life is more than meat. I know there are many sparrows all over the world they're found, but our Heavenly Father knows when one of us falls to the ground. Though small, we are never forgotten. Though weak, we are never afraid. For we know that the dear Lord keeps the lives of the creatures he made. I fly through the thickest forest. I live on many a spray. I have no chart or compass, but I never lose my way. And then a beautiful way to consider 
an infinite personal God and Jesus's assurance that we are worth many, many sparrows. And so we can depend on God and not humanity. His word becomes a promise and a perspective through which to view the challenges we face in this world. Treasure precious time with friends and family. Prioritize God's promises over humanity's frail hope. This is my desire for the Woodside congregation today. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Loving God in heaven, thank you so much for your word and the promises that you know how many hairs are on our head. You know. And nothing comes to us, but it doesn't come through you and your permissive will for our lives to mold us after your character. I pray for Woodside Congregation that they would be filled with your Holy Spirit to overflowing. We praise you for the progress that's been made with the virus, but we ask for you to see us through this last leg. Help us to finish strong and intact as a post-quarantine church. If this is your will, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Woodside Church family. So glad to see each of you on our virtual audience today.